Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and welcome to our Friday morning virtual journal club. Um, I uh, um, am really thrilled to be able to offer a program that will hopefully provide some significant clarity on um, peripheral cell neoplasm and what, what it means uh, when you get um, a cytology uh, report back um, indicating peripheral cell uh, present in that biopsy. Um, to present uh, this morning, we've got two outstanding experts. Um, Dr. Carrie, Carrie Lubitz is an endocrine surgeon at Mass General Hospital. Um, in addition to her formal training in endocrine surgery, Carrie obtained a master's in uh, public health, and she also spent two years studying the genetic basis of thyroid cancer. She is currently an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School and a senior scientist at the MGH Institute for Technology Assessment. Carrie is currently the PI on a federally funded research project examining the potential impact of new diagnostic technologies and personalized management strategies in patients with thyroid cancer. Um, this is, also, is combined with an American Cancer Society Research Scholar Award to develop a thyroid cancer specific quality of life index. Um, and so we welcome her expertise um, in thyroidology along with our discussant today who has gotten up uh, really bright and early on the West Coast. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Kane um, is professor of pathology at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is also the director of cytopathology fellowship program at UCLA. Um, he recently uh, migrated from Boston um, out to Los Angeles um, where in Boston, he was Associate Director of Cytology and Chief of Head and Neck Pathology at Brigham and Win Women's Hospital in Boston. Um, he is currently the Associate Editor of the Journal of um, Cancer Cytopathology, and he is also co-author of the Bethesda System for Reporting Thyroid Cytopathology. He is obviously uniquely qualified um, to serve as a discussant today and look forward to both of your presentations. I just want to encourage everyone to um, uh, to give us your questions, and as every week, I will do my best to um, get to as many of those questions before the end of the hour. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Camilo to go ahead and present um, our poll question this morning, and then we'll get started with the program. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to present to you a case of a 39-year-old woman that was diagnosed with a thyroid nodule. An ultrasound, the nodule was described as a single solid isoechoic uh, nodule measuring 2.7 by 2.9 by 1.4 centimeters with oval shape, irregular margins, and uh, the patient underwent DFNA, which was reported as a follicular neoplasm, category 4 of Bethesda, which uh, had presence of hurdle cells. Based on the above uh, described cytopathologic findings, which would, you, which would you explain to your patient that the presence of hurdle cells implies? A higher risk of malignancy, B, a lower risk of malignancy, C, no difference in risk of malignancy compared to lesions with where hurdle cells are not found, or D, there is not enough evidence to explain the impact of hurdle cells on thyroid lesions based on cytopathology. Um, well, thank you so much, um, Mark and Camillo, um, for, for um, inviting me to present um, at this uh, Virtual Thyroid Journal Club. Uh, it's an honor, and uh, it really seems like a, a great program, and I hope that uh, people will log on um, regularly. I think it's great. We have a bunch of uh, my own uh, residents and fellow and everyone from, from uh, my, my institution as well logging in, so I think it's going to be a great program. And obviously, uh, uh, to thank the Thank Foundation. Um, and so without further ado, I have no, no disclosures um, as... Um, uh, Mark uh, stated, I do have, I do want to acknowledge the American Cancer Society and the uh, NCI for support of, of my time and, and research and my research team. So um, this is hard to really present this to Dr. Crane, but I'm going to try to do some uh, pathology review, a little background before we get into talking about the, the main uh, thought of talking about uh, the article that we're going to focus on today. Um, but briefly, I just wanted to um, outline a little bit about what has been changing in terms of the classification of uh, Herthel cell lesions. 
Um, and so we'll review uh, briefly the Bethesda classification and, and the risk of malignancy that's been outlined um, at the latest time in 2017, um, the switch of the Herthel cell away from uh, the grouping of follicular thyroid carcinoma and the fourth edition of the WHO classification. And then we'll get into um, why that occurred, uh, generally um, uh, thought to be from two landmark articles, one of which came out of our institution. Um, and then we'll get into the concept of, you know, what are these uh, small amount of Herthel cells within the our fine needle aspirates um, that we see it, and whether or not um, we can answer that question that Camillo posed a little bit um, with more data behind it. So just to start off, um, most of us are familiar with this, the Bethesda classification, so the diagnostic categories of one to six on the on the under the on the left side there. And Herthel cells are generally uh, not much set aside in the 2017 uh, rendition of this, um, but that Herthel cell type refers to cellular aspirates almost exclusively of Herthel cells. So these are, um, I think most our pathologists here uh, would say um, uh, at least more than 75% um, of that cell type, and, and that will make more sense in, 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 the, uh, in regards to the rest of the conversation today. But that, that overall, this uh, portends a 10 to 40% uh, ROM is risk of malignancy. And these usually fall under the Bethesda 4 classification or follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. They're fourth down on the left. And this is showing, this is a, uh, uh, the, the uh, excuse me, the WHO classification. You can see on the bottom here that HCC or Herthel cell carcinoma, which is not everything we're talking about today, just to, re to remind everyone, um, but that because um, of a lot of the genetic characterization of these tumors um, in the last few years, this has been, borne out a separate category um, and because of this unique genetic profile. This is a beautiful picture that was lent to me by Peter Sadow, who's uh, my close friend and colleague here, uh, uh, endocrine pathologist, showing that beautiful granular cytoplasm, which is chock full of mitochondria, as well as these prominent nucleoli um, that are uh, characteristic of these beautiful Herthel cells. And this is a Herthel cell carcinoma showing the a little um, uh, bit of tumor uh, within the, uh, I believe it's in lymphatic system there, you can see, um, uh, on the bottom right of that beautiful picture. So this is just briefly touching on um, uh, Dr. Gopal, who is uh, my colleague here uh, at Mass General, who he, he and a, 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 our group uh, uh, published this uh, in Cell in 2018, along with the, the next article, which I will briefly present um, from Memorial Sloan Kettering. These both came out in the same uh, edition, which I thought was great. Um, the, a great amount of work and, and published together in cell, a cancer cell, which was, uh, I think, remarkable, um, showing the huge amount of work that's gone into characterizing these, these tumors. Uh, the highlights of which were that <clears throat> uh, there was this uh, very different uh, uh, loss of heterozygosity, uh, so to a near haploid state in many of these Herthel cell carcinomas. Um, and then they are listed here, this mutation in complex one of the mitochondrial um, complex one gene um, shown there on the right. And this is just showing for your, I assume these slides will be available uh, to folks over, this is the um, concomitant um, in the same issue, uh, the, the group out of Ian Ganley and the group out of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, also uh, finding similar mutational landscape of the Herthel cell carcinomas. These are great articles to read and, and really landmark articles to characterize this tumor. So moving on to um, uh, really, what do these mean um, in terms of the risk of, risk of malignancy beyond these uh, Bethesda categories um, and what to do with this? Uh, many of us find our fine needle uh, aspirations and the mention of Herthel cells and what to do with that. So as I said before, Herthel cells shown here on the right um, are large polygonal cells with granular eosinophilic cytoplasm and prominent nucleoli. Um, they are found in both benign and malignant neoplasms, in, and in, they also in Hashimoto's glands, so lymphocytic thyroiditis. Um, and so the question was, um, uh, Dr. Randolph and Dr. Wren um, put together this uh, fantastic group of people to look at, um, does Herthel cell presence increase the risk of cancer beyond that suspicious, suspicious for follicular neoplasm or that Bethesda 4 classification? So um, we looked at... Um, uh, 13-year experience um, retrospectively. Um, the inclusion criteria, which was were drawn from the surgical pathology database, um, we, have, we identified 1,400 cytology reports. 300 of these um, had um, correlated um, surgical pathology um, that had a Bethesda classification listed on the report. 
we were able to obtain 203 of those 300 slides um, from uh, from the retrieval and uh, Dr. Faquin, who is our uh, expert uh, cytopathologist here, um, would went back and looked at the Herthel cell content um, within those within those uh, slides that were available. So this is just showing the distribution uh, of the the 300 uh, patients that had surgical pathology and went back and looked at what was their original uh, Bethesda classification. So that's showing uh, the one through six on the right. And not surprisingly, the vast majority are within the uh, Bethesda four. I would also note that there was a large portion within the benign group, and that will be discussed as one of the limitations of the study. And maybe one of those things that varies from institution to institution in terms of um, how these are categorized. The next uh, table here on the right shows of the 203 slides that were re-reviewed by Dr. Faquin, showing in his estimation what the uh, degree of Herthel cell presence was. So mild being less than 25% of the slide, moderate 25 to 75, and predominant greater than 75. And that's what most pathologists, I believe, would consider um, uh, important in terms of calling something a Herthel cell neoplasm. So this is showing now the correlation of the, the Bethesda classification from the fine needle aspiration on the left and the final histologic uh, diagnosis. So overall, there was a, approximately 20% risk of malignancy in the 300 specimens. And the vast majority of these were uh, seen within, uh, sorry, the risk of malignancy went up as you would expect from uh, one to six, which is uh, which is what we see. But also it should be noted that it wasn't, the vast majority of the Herthel cell carcinomas were within that Bethesda four classification, but that what they weren't all Herthel cell carcinomas. So keep in mind, if you look at that Bethesda four, there were nine PTCs and one follicular and one medullary. And this is just showing that on the right, that of the cancers, while 50% of them were Herthel cell carcinomas, there was also a large portion of papillaries, follicular, and medullaries. And now, um, here is the meat of the, the study that we're going to be discussing. The first thing, so this is looking at the, the 203 patients that were re-reviewed that had final surgical pathology and also had a Bethesda classification. So on the left, that's looking at Bethesda one through six, and this is mild, moderate, and predominant degree of Herthel cell presence on re-review of the slides. So uh, the one thing I'll note here um, is that in Bethesda 4, um, if you look at the vast majority of these had a predominant um, uh, phenotype, or I should say presence of Herthel cells. Now these figures um, look at um, the percentage of patients and the risk of malignancy based on Bethesda classification. And, and this is just a nice way to illustrate that as the Bethesda classification goes up, so does the risk of malignancy. And then on the right, um, this is also showing that as the predominance of Herthel cells goes up, the risk of malignancy likewise goes up. Important finding, ex it's somewhat expected, but important to, to validate the, the study. And then um, lastly, this was a comparison um, of uh, our cohort with a, a, an external cohort, uh, a large group of patients of, that had included all FNA. So this included both patients with Herthel cell uh, presence and without, um, and compared whether or not what the, the risk of malignancy was in this um, external cohort. The first thing to note um, is that the 20% um, that overall we had a lower risk of malignancy than the external cohort. And the one thing that was brought up is that, that there, the, the relatively um, high rate of predominant Herthel cells that were considered benign on cytopathology. And this is just something that uh, these were re-reviewed and still thought based on the other characteristics um, of, the, of the cytology, um, uh, that this would still be listed under benign. Um, and so uh, this, cause a bit of concern with the reviewers, just because if it's over 75% um, Herthel cell presence, um, most, most pathologists or some pathologists would consider this um, a Herthel cell neoplasm and move it up to a Bethesda 4. So these are one of the things we can, we can discuss a little bit with Dr. Crane 
So uh, in conclusion, the Herthel cell did not increase the risk beyond the Bethesda category. Remember the 10 to 40% risk for suspicious for follicular neoplasm that was outlined in the 2017 Bethesda classification. And that other things should be used to, to um, assign um, the risk of malignancy, including microfollicular pattern, absence of colloid and inflammation, transgressing blood vessels, and at cellular atypia. And the limitations which we discussed at the comparison group included Herthel cell presence, um, but this would actually probably decrease um, the effect measure and the conclusions that we made. And, only, and we only have data on those patients who underwent surgery. I did want to mention another article um, which came out recently um, and uh, looking at, uh, I believe, oh, I'm blanking right now. I think it might be at Memorial, uh, but could be wrong. Uh, 2017 to 2020, I am wrong, I think it's Yale, actually, um, and they included patients with um, Herthel cell neoplasm on the uh, pathology, and I believe they only included Bethesda 4, um, and of the 7,200 FNAs performed at their institution, 273 had this category. Uh, of those 273, 137 underwent surgery, so similar to our cohort. And of those, 20% of them had malignancy, very similar to, to our group. If you remember, that's in comparison to 10 to 40% uh, for all comers for suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Interestingly, they also, um, in their group, they did reflex molecular testing. So this could have been ThyroSeq, Affirma, um, uh, any of the other molecular tests. So 85 of those patients also had molecular testing done, and 52 of those had some anomaly detected. Uh, molecular changes were as likely to be found in benign and non-neoplastic lesions as in the neoplasms. So again, a conundrum. And this is just showing their, uh, the breakdown of the ones that had malignancy, the 28 patients, um, the majority of which were uh, Herthel cell carcinoma, but also you saw this papillary follicular and poorly differentiated. Overall risk of malignancy, 20%. And we're not going to go through all of this on the slide, but this is just showing that of those uh, going through the findings of those um, molecular abnormalities that were identified in those patients, um, it was sort of all over the spectrum and there wasn't any clear um, correlation between um, specific mutations um, and the neoplastic nature. And this is a great quote. There is a uh, a great editorial by uh, Dr. Sato, uh, who in Cancer Cytopathology, Pathology, actually, I believe this past month, it, was ju it just came out, um, and I thought this was a great quote. Most Herthel cell lesions are indolent, except for those that are not, and this can be difficult to predict. It sounds like a Yogi Berra quote. Um, and so this is the, the article, and I think it's a great read, um, and, um, and, and uh, all of these can, are available to you by slides. Um, I'd be happy to share them with, with whomever. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Erkin and the and uh, the Thank Foundation for inviting me to speak with you this morning. Uh, and uh, I'd also uh, like to thank Dr. Lubitz uh, for her terrific uh, presentation of uh, this very interesting uh, and I think ti timely paper. Uh, so I I'm just going to uh, a, there'll be a little bit of repetition, but hopefully not uh, too much. Uh, I'm really going to try to focus a little bit more on uh, giving you the cytopathologist's uh, perspective uh, on Herthel cells and the challenges that they they pose for us, uh, and then we'll uh, bring some of that discussion uh, back to uh, the, the the paper that's un under discussion. Uh, let me uh, just get my laser pointer going here, and we're up and uh, I just point out that I also have uh, no disclosures to make with regard to the content uh, of my talk. Uh, so as you've already heard, uh, a Herthel cell, uh, the definition uh, uh, before you on the screen here, uh, this is as defined by the, the Bethesda system. Uh, Atlas is a uh, follicular cell with an abundance of finely uh, granular cytoplasm. Uh, and that seems like a relatively uh, straightforward uh, definition, and in many instances it is. Here's, uh, this is an example of a normal macro follicle uh, for us of, of uh, follicular cells without Herthel cell change. Uh, and you can see that there's very scanty cytoplasm. Uh, the nuclei are very, very small and round with a dark condensed chromatin. Uh, and then uh, you have a couple of ex examples of cells exhibiting uh, Herthel cell change. Uh, most dramatically, this single cell uh, 
uh, here, uh, as well as a more macro follicular uh, configuration of a group of Herthel cells here. Uh, in both instances, you're seeing uh, they are cells that have abundant granular cytoplasm due to the increased mitochondrial content uh, of those cells. I would also point out this group uh, up here in the uh, in the upper right-hand corner, and I think uh, this, this may uh, have some relevance when we start to uh, talk about uh, how cytopathologists uh, uh, report on Herthel cells and when they report on Herthel cells, uh, because these cells here uh, have less abundant granular cytoplasm, but they certainly have some degree of, of granular cytoplasm uh, compared to the normal follicular cells. And often in our discussions amongst ourselves, we'll use the term hertholoid uh, to reflect that there often can be a spectrum uh, of Herthel cell change that we see in cytologic uh, preparations. Uh, and as a result of that, there's not always going to be uniform agreement uh, amongst cytopathologists as to what actually is a Herthel cell and when you actually mention that uh, in your in your report. Uh, when do we see Herthel cells? Again, you've heard, heard some of this already, uh, but we can see them in a, in a variety of non-neoplastic as well as neoplastic uh, conditions. Uh, for for, for non-neoplastic uh, conditions, uh, certainly Hashimoto's thyroiditis is, is probably the most common scenario where we're gonna encounter uh, uh, Herthel cells, expect to see Herthel cells essentially uh, as one of uh, our uh, main diagnostic criteria for recognizing that we're dealing with Hashimoto thyroiditis in addition to the presence of lymphocytes. Uh, and then uh, we often see Herthel cells as a metaplastic change in patients who have multinodular hyperplasia. So we see hyperplastic Herthel cells, uh, Herthel cell nodules quite frequently in patients with goiters. Uh, then in uh, neoplasms, uh, uh, obviously, Herthel cell adenomas and the, the malignant counterpart, Herthel cell carcinomas, uh, are going to be our, our main concern for Herthel cell rich aspirates. Uh, certainly, we can see them in tumors that ultimately uh, uh, prove to be uh, follicular adenomas or follicular carcinomas, uh, since the, the definitional difference there is, is using the 75% cutoff for the presence of, of Herthel cells, and certainly due to sampling on FNA it's possible to have uh, some discrepancy there between uh, something that might be called Herthel cell rich uh, on an FNA and not proving to reach that 75% threshold uh, on resection. Uh, how do we define Herthel cell neoplasia? This, this is, uh, again, seemingly a relatively straightforward uh, exercise, again, from the Bethesda Atlas. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the aspirates that we're going to put into this category of suspicious for a follicular neoplasm of Herthel cell type. Uh, that's kind of a mouthful. I'll just say suspicious for Herthel cell neoplasm going forward. Uh, th those are cellular aspirates that consist uh, exclusively or nearly exclusively uh, of Herthel cells. And in the examples that you can see here, it's a very straightforward diagnosis. And there are particular features that we'd like to see uh, that are said to be more predictive of neoplasia or even of malignancy, and that is a loss of cohesion of the Herthel cells, where we see uh, numerous individual Herthel cells present, uh, where or we can see so-called dysplastic changes uh, of the large cell variety in which there's marked nuclear size variation, as you can see here, uh, or sm so-called small cell dysplasia, uh, where we see Herthel cells that start to take on, uh, uh, actually have less cytoplasm and they exhibit higher uh, NC ratios. Uh, these are all features that uh, that make for a relatively straightforward diagnosis of saying something suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm. Uh, there are Herthel cell mimics that we can uh, encounter where other cell uh, other cell types uh, that that can have abundant, uh, seemingly granular cytoplasm. Uh, so this can include oncocytic neoplasms, uh, particularly papillary carcinomas. There's an oncocytic variant of papillary carcinoma. Uh, medullary carcinomas uh, as well can be a mimic, as well as some other tumors that, that are listed here. Uh, we really have to pay very close attention to nuclear features to avoid uh, these pitfalls. Uh, I would just point out that in normal aspirates where we have cystic degeneration, histiocytes, uh, which are you know very common finding for us in in uh, thy thyroid FNA specimens, uh, particularly if they congregate together, sometimes they can be a challenge for us to distinguish uh, from Herthel cells. Uh, 
these are all kind of the standard differential diagnostic considerations that, uh, that, that we encounter. And for the most part, they don't really pose significant challenges uh, for us. Uh, I, I think where uh, cytopathologists really start to struggle uh, with peripheral cell rich uh, uh, neoplasms isn't so much uh, in terms of you know, how to classify what we're looking at, uh, but it, it's when we really start to have a dichotomy between what we're seeing uh, under the under the microscope and what the clinical information is that that's given to us and that sometimes uh, gives us pause. Uh, so when we have cellular aspirates with, that are rich in Herthel cells, uh, but the clinical setting uh, might be suggestive of a benign aspirate, particularly a patient who who we're told uh, has Hashimoto thyroiditis or perhaps has a, a multinodular thyroid. Uh, you know, for many of us, that makes us a little bit reluctant to go all the way to saying that that's uh, suggestive of a Herthel cell neoplasm, and we may prefer to put it into that Bethesda 3 category of AUS+. Plus. And uh, on this topic, uh, the, the Bethesda system does address it, uh, but basically it's ag agnostic with regard to, to what the appropriate decision uh, is in, in this clinical context. Uh, it's basically said that, you know, it's really up to the individual uh, pathologist to decide whether they want to put that uh, into a Bethesda 3 or a Bethesda 4 category when they have a Herthel cell rich aspirate and uh, clinical findings that may, may not quite uh, line up with calling that uh, su suggestive of a Herthel cell neoplasm. I just want to talk about these uh, two benign conditions and, and, uh, and, and, and how they line up with uh, Herthel cell rich aspirates uh, briefly. Uh, I think Hashimoto thyroiditis is probably uh, really the bigger of, of the two concerns for us. Uh, certainly, you know, the, when we have an aspirate that looks like what you're seeing on your screen here, it's a it's a relatively straightforward diagnosis for us. Uh, numerous lymphoid cells, a polymorphous lymphoid population in the background, and then you can see a collection uh, of Herthel cells present as well. Uh, but then uh, when we start to get nervous as cytopathologists is when we are told that the patient has a history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, but we don't see the lymphoid cells. Instead, we just see uh, a Herthel cell rich aspirate. Or conversely, per, there is no history of Hashimoto thyroiditis, uh, but we do see some lymphoid cells there and we start to have concern that perhaps this is an instance of Hashimoto thyroiditis that just hasn't been recognized clinically uh, yet. And even when we're certain that there is uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis, in some instances we can get you know, just a, a very dramatic uh, proliferation of Herthel cells uh, that may not have uh, you know, all the cohesion that we would hope to see. Uh, and so when there's a, a real marked predominance of Herthel cells, even when we're confident that we're dealing with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, sometimes that can be difficult for us to feel comfortable uh, putting into the benign uh, category. Uh, so uh, they, they, these questions uh, have been have been looked at on, on the cytology side in terms of you know what is the impact of a diagnosis of Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, on the malignancy rate in aspirates that have been called suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm. Uh, this question was uh, looked at in a multi-institutional study back in 2011. There were 287 resected Herthel cell uh, nodules in that study. And what they found in that study was comparing uh, those uh, nodules uh, that uh, from patients who did have Hashimoto's thyroiditis compared to those who did not have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, that the uh, incidence of uh, neoplasia uh, was lower in the Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, patient population, and it was statistically significant. Uh, the incidence of malignancy in the Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, population of patients uh, was also lower than the, the patients who did not have Hashimoto thyroiditis. Uh, but it, uh, because the case numbers were small uh, in this uh, instance, it looked like there was a statistical trend there, but it didn't rise to the level uh, of statistical significance. But I think uh, for us as cytopathologists, most of us have kind of taken, uh, you had the take home point from, from this study uh, that it probably is worth being cautious uh, about putting something into the suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm category, probably better to opt for a Bethesda 3 diagnosis uh, if you have the suspicion uh, that they're, they, or the knowledge that the patient has uh, uh, hash. Uh, what about the question of uh, patients who have a Herthel cell predominant uh, thyroid FNA? Uh, 
and have uh, either solitary or, or multiple nodules. Uh, certainly, I think intuitively, most of us would anticipate that the uh, risk of neoplasia and the risk of malignancy uh, would be higher in patients who have a solitary nodule rather than a multiple than, rather than having multiple nodules. Uh, we conducted a multi-institutional study uh, trying to look at this question uh, recently. Uh, ultimately, we ended up with uh, 576 resected Herschel cell predominant nodules, uh, the vast majority of which uh, ended up in the Bethesda 3 or Bethesda 4 uh, categories. Uh, you can see that overall the risk of malignancy was on the low end of, of the, the uh, anticipated uh, spectrum of uh, risk of malignancy for, for both the Bethesda 3 and Bethesda 4 aspirates, uh, which I think is going to be a recurring theme that you're going to keep, keep hearing uh, from me this morning. Uh, and when we uh, compared those patients who had single nodules versus patients who had multiple nodules, we really did not find uh, any statistically significant uh, difference in the risk of malignancy. And that was a little bit uh, unanticipated by us. Um, there, was, there was one hint, perhaps, of, uh, of, a, of a slight difference in a very small subset of patients uh, where not only did they have multiple nodules, but they had multiple nodules, all of which uh, showed a marked predominance of Herthel, Herthel cells on fine needle aspiration. Uh, th that was only a, a 10 patients in this study, and all of those patients uh, proved to have a benign outcome. Uh, so that's something that might be uh, worthy of further study uh, in, in the future, uh, but it's probably, you know, it's too small a cohort to, to really determine whether that's meaningful. Uh, overall, this is uh, really st uh, summarizing a number of different studies, uh, largely in the cytology literature, uh, show, again, focusing on the Bethesda 3 and Bethesda 4 categories, uh, where we see most of the Herthel cell uh, rich aspirates uh, diagnosed. Uh, and you can see that the, the median risk of malignancy for Herthel cell uh, uh, rich aspirates in the AUS category it was 15%, or in, uh, in the Bethesda 4 category, it was 23%. And those fall on the very low end of the uh, anticipated range uh, of the overall risk of malignancy uh, put forth uh, in the Bethesda uh, Atlas. Uh, so with that as prelude, uh, let, let's uh, uh, turn back uh, to the paper. Uh, again, just to, just to reiterate uh, a lot of uh, what the, uh, Dr. Lubitz has already said to you, uh, really the, the objective of this paper was to determine the histopathologic outcome and the risk of malignancy in, in a series of thyroid epinase that contained Herthel cell change and look at uh, this uh, across the spectrum of all uh, six Bethesda system uh, categories using uh, standardized uh, Bethesda uh, criteria. Uh, and then uh, also looking at these uh, same FNAs uh, when subcategorized based on the degree of Herthel cell change that was present. Uh, and of course, the hope here is to uh, inform clinicians uh, in terms of uh, how to optimally uh, respond to the information that there are Herthel cells present in a given thyroid uh, FNA specimen. Uh, I just want to uh, make some observations uh, uh, about the uh, uh, study design. Uh, and uh, I, I think this is certainly a very valuable study. Uh, I do think we have to just point out a, just a, a few caveats uh, here. Uh, so the time period of the, the cases that were collected for the study uh, was over a broad range, uh, going from 2000 to 2013. Uh, and uh, this does largely precede the implementation of the Bethesda system, uh, certainly at the institution, which is uh, MGH, where, uh, where these, uh, uh, FNAs were interpreted. Uh, they did have a system that very closely aligns with the with the Bethesda system, uh, but it's possible uh, that in the preceding time period, uh, the diagnostic criteria may not have corresponded uh, precisely to what ultimately uh, was implemented in the Bethesda system, and not every practitioner may have uh, used the criteria in exactly the same uniform way uh, that we hope that we've seen since the implementation of the Bethesda system. Uh, 
I think, to reinforce that fact. You can see that uh, there are about 20% of cases that were initially identified had to be eliminated because they didn't have a diagnostic category uh, assigned to them. Uh, and that's certainly something that we wouldn't expect to see anymore uh, the, these days uh, since the Bethesda system requires us uh, to, to, to use those kinds of diagnostic uh, headers. And it's, uh, I think, uh, certainly possible that that 20% of cases uh, may, may have been uh, a very interesting subset uh, of the, of the specimens uh, pathologists. When we when we duck a, a category, it's often because we don't really know what's going on. Uh, so those could have been very interesting cases. Uh, the case selection was dependent on on the report mentioning the presence of fertile cells. And I, I mentioned that uh, uh, earlier uh, that that uh, sometimes we see what some of us might refer to as hertholoid cells and not put into the category of hertholoid cells. So pathologists do have uh, different thresholds for what they're willing to call a Herthel cell and what they what they aren't. Uh, there is no hard uh, cutoff in terms of what the definition of a Herthel cell is. Uh, so so there can be variation amongst pathologists here. Uh, and I think pathologists also have different thresholds for when they mention the presence of Herthel cells uh, in their reports. If it if it's a very focal finding in an otherwise benign report. Uh, some of us may or may, may may or may not mention the presence of hurtful cells. We just may not feel that it's all that important uh, if, if they're a relatively small component in particular. Uh, and, uh, and some of us, uh, conversely, if we're going to render a benign diagnosis, uh, we know that the fear is out there amongst clinicians uh, about the term hurtful cells. It, it, it can be a, a rather loaded uh, term, and some of us may may actually avoid mentioning Herthel cells in our reports uh, precisely for that reason. And then in some instances, if, if the Herthel cells aren't necessarily related to the prime, primary cytologic finding, uh, that may, again, the, the presence of Herthel cells may not make its way into our report. So if rendering a diagnosis of papillary carcinoma and there just happen to be a few benign Herthel cells in the background of that aspirate, uh, that that's uh, not likely to be a significant finding and, and may not actually be mentioned in the report. Uh, of course, uh, the, 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 ser the study uh, by design required uh, having a surgical follow-up and that it does introduce uh, some degree of selection bias, uh, particularly with regard to those aspirates uh, and those, those patients uh, who, who had a benign uh, aspirate. Uh, uh, in terms of the slide review, um, most of the uh, cases uh, were, were available uh, for review. Uh, there was single expert review uh, by you know, one of the world pre preeminent cytopathologists in, in this area, uh, but I think it's important for us to just uh, acknowledge uh, that this uh, may not reflect uh, every, the experience of the typical cytopathologist looking, uh, looking at a thyroid, thyroid aspirate. Uh, and uh, and I think it's it's uh, certainly very valuable information to know what the uh, quantity uh, in terms of percentages are uh, of the Herthel cells that were present in these specimens. I think it might have also been nice uh, on top of that if we had an overall sense of the cellularity. So uh, we might have an aspirate that has 70% Herthel cells, uh, but for me as a cytopathologist, that has a very different meaning if there's say only 10 cells present uh, oh, in in total in in that specimen versus say a thousand cells present, uh, so that might have been uh, nice information to have. Uh, the surgical pathology specimens that the specimens uh, that the uh, the FNA specimens were ultimately uh, compared to, as far as I could tell uh, from uh, the, these were were not uh, actually reviewed. Uh, and again, I think it's important for us just to acknowledge that this time period that was involved uh, in the study. Uh, is a little bit different, uh, perhaps, from uh, what we might encounter today. Uh, it certainly predates the introduction of the uh, NIFT-P terminology, uh, and, I, and I think uh, this time period between 2000 and 2013 probably was uh, really the kind of the PK day of people making the diagnosis of follicular variants of papillary carcinoma. So I think some of those papillary carcinomas that you saw uh, di diagnosed uh, could perhaps uh, or be reflective of uh, some somewhat different diagnostic criteria uh, during this time period than what we may encounter uh, today. Uh, again, that's a little bit speculative on, uh, on my part. Uh, and there wasn't explicit uh, description in the methodolo methodology, at least as far as I could tell, 
uh, of, of, uh, of whether uh, the diagnosis on surgical pathology clearly corresponded to the targeted FNA nodule. And, and uh, uh, it uh, would, have, would have been nice uh, to know if any cases uh, had to be eliminated uh, because there wasn't clarity about uh, the correlation between the cytology and the surgical pathology. Uh, with regard to the uh, control group, again, slightly different time period. So this is uh, clearly uh, post-implementation of the Bethesda system. So uh, we cer certainly can rely on uh, using the Bethesda system cr uh, criteria uh, strictly. Uh, of course, this is after the first edition of the Bethesda rather than the second edition, relatively minor changes uh, overall between, between those two. Uh, and I also wonder, you know, again, as we get closer to the present time, uh, there could be some impact in terms of case selection uh, for, for follow-up surgery, particularly in the Bethesda three and four categories uh, based on uh, the uh, increased implementation of molecular testing. Uh, with all of those uh, as caveats, I, I think we can still clearly point to uh, the fact that, uh, that across the board, uh, in, in this study, uh, Herthel cell lesions uh, showed uh, a low, low rate of, of malignancy uh, compared to their non-Herthel cell counterparts or, or uh, the uh, all, all comers in the control group. Uh, and again, if you, you know, use the Bethesda system uh, classification uh, over here in the anticipated risk of malignancy from the Bethesda system, you can see that these uh, aspirates consistently uh, fall on the low side of the anticipated uh, range that we'd expect to see. And again, we just have to be mindful here, particularly in the non-diagnostic and benign categories, uh, that these are patients who underwent surgery, whereas these estimates are, are, are all comers, including the many patients in these categories uh, who would not ultimately go on to, to surgery. Uh, and then uh, just in terms of our take-home messages, uh, I, I think this paper very nicely demonstrates uh, that the presence of Herthel cells uh, does not increase uh, the risk of malignancy overall for a given uh, Bethesda system uh, diagnostic category. That's true, true across the board. Uh, it does have this intriguing ob observation uh, that when there's a marked predominance of Herthel cells in a benign aspirate, that there may be uh, an increased risk of malignancy. Uh, you know, we could speculate about uh, why why that might uh, be, uh, and uh, I'd be I'd be glad to discuss discuss that further if the, if there's some uh, in, in interest in that. Uh, but again, here I think we do have to be mindful that these are benign aspirates that that went to surgery, and we're not quite sure you know why those particular patients had surgery done as opposed to the many patients who have benign aspirates who don't go to surgery. Uh, and then I just want to reiterate that, you know, Herthel cell lesions are consistently challenging uh, for us in the cytopathology uh, community. Uh, these typically will uh, fall into the Bethesda 2, 3, and 4 categories, so benign, AUS plus, uh, and suspicious for a Herthel cell neoplasm. Uh, but overall, they appear to be relatively low risk uh, lesions at the lower end of the anticipated risk of malignancy uh, spectrum. Uh, within each of those categories. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll, I'll complete my presentation. Thank you very much. Again, we have a 39-year-old woman that was diagnosed with a thyroid nodule. An ultrasound the nodule was described as a single solid isoechoic measuring 2.7 by 2.9 by 1.4. The nodule was oval-shaped with irregular margins, and the patient underwent FNA that was reported as follicular neoplasm, category 4 of this uh, uh, system for reporting cytopathology. The, this, this sample had presence of hurdle cells, and based on the above described cytopathologic findings, would you explain to your patient that the presence of hurdle cells implies A, a higher risk of malignancy, B, a lower risk of malignancy, C, no difference in risk of malignancy compared to lesions where hurdle cells are not found, or D, there is not enough evidence to explain the impact of hurdle cells in thyroid lesions based on the cytopathology? Terrific. Uh, well, thank you both, um, Kerry and Jeff, for outstanding presentations. Um, I know that I can speak for myself. I learned a great deal this morning. Um, I think Camilo had a question that he wanted to pose before we get to um, as quite a few questions from our audience here. Camilo? Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to I, I want to congratulate you both for this wonderful presentation. I had a, a quick question for Dr. Lubitz. Um, 
given that uh, uh, quote you, you presented by Dr. Sato at the end, the Yogi Berra conundrum that we have, what is, what is the regular protocol that you do or how do you go about uh, explaining or discussing this type of results with your patients given that when they consult Dr. Google after finding that they have hurdle cells in their sample, how do you, how do you make, make that decision? How do you make that, have that, um, that? Yeah, I, I got you. Um, so first of all, I think the most important, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Crane's presentation was fantastic, and um, I think I think that shows that. Uh, and I have a fantastic uh, working relationship with uh, with Bill Fakewin and Peter Sadow here uh, at MGH. And first of all, talking with them about it is important, and and learning from each other, like we're doing this morning, about how to interpret it and making sure we know the data. That's the most important thing as as clinicians that we we know these things and we're reviewing the data and keeping up to date with what these new findings that we're seeing, as you can see, just in the past five years, the, the research on Herthel cell um, uh, genetics and, and um, outcomes has been um, really skyrocketing. So um, knowing your data is the most important thing. Um, I would definitely tell, um, uh, like like we've been saying, that to, to not um, overread um, the, First of all, patients reading cytology, it's hard for me to interpret a cytology report. So I think that's already a challenging thing for us. And actually just recently, there's a federal law now in the United States that um, <laughs> the cytology reports are gonna be accessible to patients right away. And so we're gonna need to learn to have these conversations. Um, they can be challenging, but I think uh, knowing the data, explaining to patients, um, as, as well as we can in layman's terms, um, that the risk is the same as what we've been discussing based on the, the um, cytology with the Bethesda classification um, and just trying to allay any fears of hearing a fancy word. So I usually say it's just a description of a cell and I actually go into my whole little, my little spiel about the mitochondria. That usually gets them to stop asking questions. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Great. Um, I, would, would either of you care to comment, uh, probably this is more Jeff, um, on the question of how much concordance there is um, among different cytopathologists, and obviously this may vary from based on the clinical setting, but with respect to interpretation and um, classifying the percentage of, um, uh, of critical cells in a specimen, would you expect this to be a challenging um a concordance issue or not really yeah uh, you know as, as i mentioned you know i think uh what what one pathologist uh considers to be a herthel cell and, an, and another doesn't uh I, I i think can be a challenge uh usually probably at the low end of the spectrum so i think those are the ones where we don't really have much concern in in the first place uh generally speaking when you're getting up into that 75 percent range uh, where we really start to think about a, a Herthel cell neoplasm, that type of aspirate, uh, I don't think, for the most part, we're not going to have much of a struggle in terms of having a uh, pretty good inter-observer uh, agreement on those aspirates. We do get rare aspirates that will have what look to us to be some kind of a concerning uh, characteristic, but where we have some uncertainty about well, do I put this into the Herthel cell neoplasm category or the follicular neoplasm category, or even in some instances, you know, there's, you know, there are rare cases where we're not sure whether we're dealing with a Herthel cell neoplasm or a medullary or a Herthel cell neoplasm or, or a papillary. Uh, but th those are relatively few uh, instances uh, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, uh, I would say. Great. Um, could either of you comment on the question? Dr. Chen, who is a cytopathologist at Mount Sinai in New York here, has raised three um, important questions. One relates to the size of a Herthel cell um, lesion, and um, the other two relate to the presence of um, uh, TERT mutations um, and also the presence of RAS mutations. Um, could either of you or both comment on size, TERT, and RAS? as it relates to interpretation here? I'm gonna cover the size because that's the easier one. Um, uh, no, I think that uh, I just reviewed this recently for the the American Association of Endocrine Surgery Guidelines, uh, thyroidectomy guidelines um, about size and um, risk of malignancy as well as prognosis based on size. 
Um, and at least from my interpretation of literature with papillary thyroid carcinoma is that size did not uh, portend a, um, necessarily a risk of malignancy or um, uh, prognos prognostic factors, meaning survival and recurrence. However, with follicular neoplasms, which also include herthel cell neoplasms, that the larger the size, um, that um, if it was a cancer, it had a worse prognosis, meaning um, so get a little bit more worried if it's four centimeters than if it's one centimeter. And happy to, you know, uh, Dr. Crane, if you have um, other data to uh, refute that, please do. No, um, no. I don't, yeah, I don't know as much about, I, I think we, I think the, we've just recently um, characterized the genetic makeup of these tumors. And I don't think there's enough data on the Herthel cell carcinomas, but we're working on it to specifically, and as I was showing, there are tons of different types of mutations um, about, you know, can we, for instance, like medullary and different um, uh, RET uh, mutations, uh, various, you know, uh, uh, this is where you have a surgeon talking about very specific mutational things. This is going to get interesting, but um, I'm sure Peter's laughing at me right now uh, offline, um, is that, um, uh, I don't think we know enough about to say this specifically has a higher risk of uh, of, of cancer or a poorer prognosis. Um, TERT mutations scare me in general, uh, probably because the the combination of BRAF and TERT and, and papillary and poorly differentiated tumors that, um, can makes me nervous because we know there's a worse outcome. But I'm not sure about that with um, with Herthel cell carcinomas. Please, uh, Dr. Crane, if you know more about that. Yeah, I don't. I I don't think I I know too much more about this than than you do, uh, other than to say that you know uh, tert mutations do show up in a relatively small uh, percentage of of peripheral cell carcinomas. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been looked at uh, extensively uh, in these tumors relative to other tumors that have tert mutations. But I think uh, clearly tert mutations make make all of us nervous in terms of uh, you know what 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 the implications of that might be. Uh, prognostically. I think with regard uh, to the question about RAS mutations, again, they, these certainly show up uh, at a much lower frequency uh, in Herthel cell uh, neoplasms than, than they do uh, in uh, follicular uh, neoplasms uh, as, as a whole. And again, you, know, you do have to remember that uh, there, there is a, a threshold issue uh, in distinguishing something that ends up being called a Herthel cell adenoma versus a uh, follicular adenoma and likewise a follicular uh, carcinoma versus a, a, a Herthel cell carcinoma. There can be uh, a little bit of subjectivity uh, involved there. So I think it's not so surprising uh, that there's a little bit of spillover in terms of the mutations that we see between one category and the other. Could you just clarify on that, Jeff, in terms of your classification of a Herthel cell carcinoma versus a follicular cell carcinoma? Um, yeah, is so, that so the yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah. Ahead. The, the, the threshold, uh, as defined by the WHO, is that the the tumor should be comprised of 75% uh, or more Herthel cells uh, to be classified as a Herthel cell neoplasm rather rather than a follicular neoplasm. And again, just because you know one person's Herthel cell is not always the same as another person's Herthel cell, and because these even you know truthfully making these percentage estimates. Uh, it's a it's a pretty subjective exercise as a pathologist when you're looking across you know say maybe 10 slides of a tumor and you're just kind of eyeballing from one slide to the next what the percentages are uh, there's going to be some degree of inter observer disagreement uh, when you have lesions that are kind of falling on the borderline uh, between those two categories okay great um, one of our um, endocrinologists here in New York, Dr. Bia, has posed a question regarding Hashimoto's thyroiditis um, and um, their appearance on ultrasound of being small and hypodense on sonography, um, as opposed to those that are newly diagnosed um, hash glands. Um, in your experience, does the duration of Hashimoto's thyroiditis um, affect herthel cell content within a fine needle aspirate? I'm gonna let you take that. I'll take a talk <laughs> yeah. one. Uh, it looks yeah, like yeah, a high, but <laughs> you know, I I I don't think I've ever really looked at them in uh, in a rigorous way uh, with that knowledge of the length of time uh, about uh, a patient's uh, having uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis. Certainly, if we try to, you know, if I 
try to correlate in my mind, you know, longstanding Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, sometimes there there'll be more uh, fibrosis and atrophy uh, of the of the gland in in, in that setting, and uh, perhaps the lymphocytic component may get a little bit more burned out. I think that what I would anticipate in that setting is that you may have less cellularity uh, overall, but it's conceivable at least that you might have uh, a higher percentage of fertile cells. Uh, in that setting, but that's really completely just guesswork on my part. All right, well that 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 works. Um, can you comment? Uh, we'll, go can ahead, ask Carrie. A question: Can you comment? Um, because I, I don't I don't know how many pathologies are online, but um, about the oncocytic variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, um, and because sometimes, oftentimes, I you might get a pathology report that says you know, with her herthal cell change, papillary thyroid carcinoma with herthal cell change. And I believe it's just the nuclear changes, but can you just clarify how you distinguish that from um, herthal cell neoplasms? Yeah, you know, pap yeah, the, the whole terminology of papillary carcinoma is, you know, something that we're really stuck with uh, as a historical uh, thing. You know, you know, papillary carcinomas were originally recognized as these tumors, you know, basically the classic variants of papillary carcinoma that we're all familiar with. Uh, and, you know, the papillae are such a prominent feature of these tumors that these really uh, are what, de what defined them in, in our minds for, for many, many years. And then there was a shift, uh, particularly with the introduction of follicular variants uh, as a category, uh, towards recognizing that the diagnosis of papillary carcinoma really uh, is based much more on the nu nuclear features uh, of these tumors and, and is not reliant on, on, on the architecture. Uh, so ultimately, that distinction between uh, a papillary carcinoma uh, and, say, a herthal, some type of herthal cell neoplasm, they can have very similar uh, cytoplasmic changes, so they can have similar oncocytic uh, features, but, but the distinction really relies on having the, the classic uh, nuclear cytomorphology that we associate with papillary carcinoma. That's why I did I did mention um, that you know I, I think during this time period uh, of 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 the cohort in your study, uh, you, you know I think there were, there are many years there where we as pathologists everything was starting to look like papillary carcinoma to us and uh, and, and you know because it, it is a bit of a slippery slope. Um, in, in terms of uh, some of the nuclear features that we see. I'm talking now on, on, his, on histology. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think the pendulum has now started to swing back. The, you know, the introduction of the NIFP terminology uh, certainly is an example of that. And, uh, and, and I think perhaps, again, this is really speculative on my part, I think uh, the oncocytic variant of, of PTC uh, may be an example of that too. I would say that in my practice, I mean, we certainly see them. It it, it exists as an entity, uh, but in my experience, they're actually very uncommon. Um, this is a question for Jeff, um, and it uh, comes from Dr. Coben in New York. If there are significant similarities um, with C cells, do you routinely stain for calcitonin in an effort to try to differentiate here? Uh, yeah, so I, I do know some pathologists who have very low thresholds for uh, trying to to make that uh, to to stain uh, these aspirates. Uh, again, I think when we focus on the nuclear features, uh, you know, we're looking for that kind of characteristic salt and peppery uh, kind of chromatin that we'll see uh, with medullary carcinomas. And there's certainly a subset of fertile cell neoplasms uh, where uh, there where it can be very a, a very challenging. Uh, distinction to make, and uh, I think one should certainly have a low threshold uh, for trying uh, to do stains. Of course, sometimes the cytologic mater material may not permit us to do those stains uh, on the FNAs, and, and in those instances where I have some degree of uncertainty, I just recommend uh, measuring the serum calcitonin levels just to, just to be sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's certainly a known pitfall. Uh, it, it only bites us uh, on rare occasions, but of course that's not a mistake that we want to make as cytopathologists. Great. Uh, I would just reiterate, that's one of the things we're looking at with our um, simulation model is screening calcitonins, um, and it's a concern of mine overall um, that while we're increasing the threshold to a, a higher size, a bigger size for biopsy in all patients, that if there's any uh, concern for a medullary thyrocarcinoma to, to check a serum calc calcitonin, that's a personal 
a recommendation, not a guideline recommendation, but they do that in Europe. I know that. Great. Hey, listen, unfortunately, and I, um, we are pushing the nine o'clock hour. This has been um, really an outstanding educational uh, presentation by both um, Carrie and Jeff, and I thank you both. I particularly uh, want to make a certain um, make certain that I acknowledge Jeff's getting up at an ungodly hour this morning to uh, participate from the West Coast. So thank you, um, and uh, thank you to all the people. Uh, who attended this morning, and thank you for all the questions, and I apologize to those who we didn't get to answer uh, their specific questions. So, um, as everyone, uh, um, please stay safe, and hope that you'll join us again next week. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Thanks. Thank great. you.